Okay, we are now recording the March 6th edition of Prehistory, A Traveler's Guide. I am your host, Eric Nadevin, and with me on the panel today are Samuel Eiler, Scott Morris, and returning back to the show in over a year since the Dr. Tom Holtz interview in January, Cameron Muskelly. You want to say a little welcome back message, Cam? Mm -hmm. You're with us. Uh oh. <laughs> oh. Well, sorry about that, folks. It seems we've lost Cam. Well, in the meantime, I will introduce our guest of honor today. We are introducing from Georgia State University, Dr. Christy Visaji. So, welcome to our program tonight, Dr. Visaji. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, uh, for anyone who isn't familiar with, with your uh, work, uh, Christy, would you uh, care to tell us what it is that you do at the university and anything else that you might want to uh, tell us? Sure. So I am a paleoecologist, and I concentrate primarily on marine invertebrates, but I have worked a little bit with um, other organisms in the marine realm. I study predator-prey interactions, think about how fossils can be used for approaching modern conservation problems, and I am also a strong advocate for uh, geoscience education, women in science, diversity in STEM, place-based learning. Lots. I love education and outreach and working with students and sharing my, my love of science. And at Georgia State, I am a lecturer and uh, the undergraduate director. Hmm. That's not, not bad at all. Not bad at all, Anarasaji. <laughs> I, I stay busy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always good. It's always good to keep your, keep your head in head, head gear doing something because, you know what, boredom just straight up kills me when I have nothing to do. <laughs> Oh. Okay, here let me up. Uh... Okay, my uh, first question here. Okay. One second here. All right, what was it that got you interested in paleontology? All right. Okay, and coming up paleontology is to specialize in marine invertebrates on top of your other fields, activities such as conservation paleobiology, paleoecology. And how did your other just in marine biology influence the direction you chose in your uh, paleontology career? All right, great question. Uh, so I suspect, like many of you, I had a love of fossils from early on. Um, I actually found a brachiopod on my gravel driveway in New Jersey when I was five years old. And for those who don't know, a brachiopod is kind of like a clam, but was popular before clams got popular <laughs> uh, in the fossil record. And so I went to museums to talk to paleontologists, figure out what is this? Joined fossil clubs, started going acting. And I also had a love for marine biology. So kind of as I went, I just kept opening doors to opportunities that allowed me to mix my interests in marine life as well as the fossil record. And uh, who were your inspirations while you were uh, growing up for wanting to become a scientist, as it were? Oh, you know, I don't know if I had any specific person uh, or, or group of people. I just, I wanted a job where I could be doing science. I could spend some time outdoors. I could um, be working uh, with others, to make discoveries, to teach others about how awesome science is. So I think there's probably different role models for different phases of my life. And um, I just didn't really target my efforts so much until probably the college years. I was just kind of doing it for fun for a while and then uh, ended up where I am. Yeah, that's, that makes Perfect. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of paleontologists have stories quite uh, similar to that as yours. And as for what got me interested in dinosaurs, it was, well, the, my, the first thing that really got me hooked was the movie Jurassic Park. And I love the giant nuclear di nuclear dinosaur Daikaiju Gojira, or also known as Godzilla. That's also got what got Sam hooked on dinosaurs, just like dinosaurs and other uh, prehistoric animals myself. 
And for right. interest in the natural world, I'd say the one guy that really got me, that got me potentially thinking about going to herpetology is uh, the late Steve Irwin. Mm. Well, for me, it wasn't just Godzilla. It was also King Kong and Jurassic Park that helped me get interested in dinosaurs. You know, your mentioning of these movies makes me think, when I was a child, I actually really loved The Land Before Time. So that was kind of a, a paleontology love from, from early on. Yeah, I really, I grew up, I grew up on those movies myself, actually. That's the first movie that came out right the same year I was born, in 1988. My, my late brother had a large little foot plushie that we still hold on to out of, you know, sentimental you know, value. Yes, I can't wait to uh, have my children watch that at some point. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I grew up watching a lot of those old stop-motion dinosaur films by Willis O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen. I, I love those movies so much. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, I know it's a little off topic, but hey, interviews about just having fun, not just discussing hard science, you know. <laughs> oh no, no, it's it's all part of the fun, absolutely. Yeah, I like my shows to have some, you know, fun to in addition to you know educational value to them. It's, yeah, I would say probably if if anything that really got me going was all those all those trips collecting fossils growing up. You know, my family joined the fossil clubs, uh, the Delaware Valley Paleontological Society. Uh, ones offered through the State Museum in New Jersey and the Calvert Marine Museum. Uh, so all those things, you know, just finding something nobody has touched for millions of years. Really exciting. Did you uh, do any uh, collecting at Haddonfield at the mall pits in New Jersey? I did not do that. Uh, I... I went to some creek beds in New Jersey to collect shark teeth and, you know, the occasional mosasaur tooth or some extra fun find like that, but I hadn't gone to any marl pits. Hmm. At least that I can remember. I don't know. My mom may correct me after this podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Okay, my first uh, science question here. All right, question number two. What do you find the most fascinating and or interesting about the types of fossils you've examined? Are there any other like, groups of animals that you're interested in possibly studying but you haven't gotten around to doing just yet? Mm. So I really love mollusks, snails and clams, I'll because they can tell... Hey, Cam! <laughs> uh, they can tell you so much about so many different things in the fossil record, uh, how they lived, depending on their shape, you know, if they were attacked by certain predators based on the traces left in the shells. You could do geochemistry and isotopes to figure out information about ocean conditions. So lots of awesome things that snails and clams can provide. If there was a group that I have always been fascinated by but have not had the chance to study, it would be insects. I just think bugs are so cool and so diverse and i if, if i had a second paleontology career i would i would go uh, study insects wow that seems really cool you in a lot of ways you could say that arthropods are basically nature's perfect creatures in many ways i yeah i i have a fondness for beetles and uh other arthropods as, as so the quote has been said. <laughs> <laughs> has anyone ever called you the bug lady, you know, in regards to those interests in insects? Uh, not the bug lady. I've gotten the, uh, you know, Miss Frizzle Fossil with a <laughs> little magic school bus nod. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think I've gotten that. Rock hammers, everyone. I did. Oh, Cam, you'll appreciate this. So my mom tells me that in kindergarten, I carried heavy bags of rocks to school for show and tell. So uh, apparently that was early on. I was setting myself apart to be uh, quite, quite nerdy, <laughs> which, you know, is great now. Maybe not everybody always felt that way towards me in classes when I was younger, but... Oh, I remember now, doing the same thing. 
Now I can own the science. As Dr. V. <laughs> yes, you sure can, Christy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, nerd, yeah. Being a geek, being a nerd, that's that's actually a cool thing. Now back when I was, you know, growing up, we got we got picked on a lot by the jock oh. by the jocks and other groups of people. I have had my share of bullying as well. I've I've been on faced with that and it's it's no fun. Well, when back when I was in school, there were a lot of jocks that actually stood up stood up for me against the, the, this this guy that used to mess around with me a lot. Uh, well, that's awesome! You had someone there to support you. I, I was kind of the teacher's pet back in school. I didn't really have a lot of uh, my mm -hmm. classmates. You know, I was a nerdy kid. Loved dinosaurs. Loved paleontology. Loved rocks. I had a good teacher back then who was my earth science teacher. Uh, I would actually skip some of his classes and uh, just go and study rocks with him. So, <laughs> who really had a huge impact. Awesome. Yeah, sometimes the, the best ways to learn aren't actually in the classroom. So it's those, those other opportunities. Don't tell my students that. They need to show up for their class this week. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> well, middle school, at least. Uh, have you done any studies on the horseshoe crabs? Uh, I have not done any studies on them, although I do have one in my lab here at Georgia State. So I have a, a bunch of different aquariums set up, and um, one of them has a little a little horseshoe crab. So it's fun watching him make circles in the sand and trails. <laughs> yeah, living fossils. Yeah. Yeah, they're so cool. I hear you're also in micropaleontology as well. Have you done anything with um, foraminifera? And red alarians. So my interest in micropaleontology, I would say that is where I'm an enthusiast. <laughs> uh, I have done a little bit of research on ostracods and forams, kind of as, as useful indicators for paleo environments when studying snails and clams in the same deposits, but I am I am by no means an expert on that. So uh, they're they're like you know little little mollusks in a way. <laughs> I mean, because some of the things that I've been researching, I've downloaded a paper just about a few weeks ago on the diversity of the foraminifera before and after the KT extinction. So I've been looking at some of the species of um, the foraminifera species that are down in the KPG boundary and after the KPG extinction event. Yeah, I know a lot of work has been done on, on forams uh, pre and post the KP, but I don't, uh, specific taxa, I don't, I don't know anything about those. So, uh, speaking of uh, bugs, uh, do you ever go hunting for trilobite fossils? Well, there's this fossil park near where I live that has many trilobite fossils in it. I I like to go up there every now and then to go looking for some. They also got brachiopods up there, too. Yeah, uh, I have found trilobites in Georgia. I suspect some of the same places Cam has been. And uh, I, when I did my undergraduate in New York, uh, there were a lot of really awesome Devonian trilobites, like Phacops and Diplora, uh, Green Ops, uh, up in the Devonian shales so anytime there was you know some new construction you got to be on the lookout to to go collect yeah in georgia we have the conasaga shell formation which is about 497 to 505 million years old yeah so the, the little itty bitty cambrian you know trilobites mostly agnostics they're cute <laughs> Every trilobite that I've ever found so far has been a small one, but I'm hoping to find a bigger one one day, like maybe about the size of my hand. I want something like an Isotelus. That would be really cool. Oh, yeah, they're really awesome. I think my favorite I have is a uh, maybe like 60% complete Diplora that I, I found in New York that's, yeah, maybe the size of my fist. I think the coolest trilobite that I've um, found was probably, I actually rediscovered a species. Um, I was talking with Dr. David Schwimmer of Columbus State University, and 
Bill Montante, who is a local fossil enthusiast. And I was out there fossil hunting with him back in 2016. And I actually rediscovered a species called Espelaspis butzi that's not known from a particular area of the Kana saga. And so I'm hoping to get that published really soon. That's probably one of my favorite trilobites. Ah, are you going to present that somewhere? Hopefully, maybe as I start college and start getting into a paleontology career, hopefully I can present it at GSA or... Yeah, you can do it. Do it. (laughs) I have a trilobite from Vermont, from near Lake Champlain. I'm not sure if it's Cambrian or Odovician, but I have one. Very tiny one. Oh, you know, I have been to some of the outcrops up there. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the age. Um, I don't think I found any trilobites when I was up there. That's There's great. There's a lot of a uh, lot of cephalopods there too, orthocones, and oh. there is a snail called Macleorides. Hmm. Yeah, that's a common fossil there. That's good. I, I like the uh, snail reference. It's always going to put a smile on my face. <laughs> so I had a question for Dr. Versaggi. Um, uh, how did you get interested in paleontology, and what advice would you have for someone who was getting into paleontology? Ah, so Cam, I think I think when you were lost on the the Skype frozen uh, land, you, you missed my initial interest. So I'll just recap quickly. <laughs> I found a brachiopod fossil when I was five. Went to museums, talked to paleontologists, joined fossil clubs, and uh, and so it began. So that's kind of how I got started. And then, what was the second part of your question? Uh, what advice would you have for a person who's going into paleontology or science in general? I see. Take a lot of science and math classes, you know, biology, chemistry, uh, statistics, take a wide variety of science and math classes, and really just, I don't know, I I kind of, I'm one of those people who who feels like if you're, if you're passionate and driven, you can, you know, make it happen. So any kind of additional experiences you can get with you know, volunteering in a lab, going on fossil field trips, you know, all all that stuff is just going to help get you to wherever you're, you need to be in the future. Going to professional conferences, meeting people, all those things. Good advice. I, uh, I got this uh, small bag here with a few small fossils in it. Uh, could you identify this one here? It looks like a shell of some kind. I can't really see with the resolution on Skype. It kind of looks it? like a brachiopod. Yeah, I was I was wondering, and then it looks like there's some, you know, shell there, but I can't I can't quite tell. Yeah, the resolution is not so good. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, so sorry, it's not so good. I'm, Alas. I'm, I'm, I'm positive it's a fossil. I just can't quite tell what kind. Where did you collect it? Uh, <laughs> actually, I got I, I uh, got it at uh, a, a dinosaur exhibi- exhibition downtown. I know there's uh, some really cool apps now for understanding geologic formations. In the, in the area, so I just have been learning about these. But if you go out and fossil collect, or you know, you're looking for places, uh, checking out some of those macrostrat and rocked, um, they might be useful. Um, this, this, sorry, I was just pulling out another piece here. Uh, this one, I'm I'm pretty sure this is petrified wood. I'm I'm quite certain. It could be. Again, I can't really tell from the resolution. It looks like there's laminations, but... Maybe a sandstone rather than a fossil. But I can't quite tell. All right. <laughs> it's hard. It's kind of hard to ID from photographs, and, and moving video blurry images makes it yeah, even sorry. more challenging. Sorry, the resolution's not so good. <laughs> Yeah, my apologies. 
No worries. Uh, all right. Um, uh, should I uh, ask one of my questions now? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, go right ahead, buddy. All right. Um, uh, how did weather affect marine ecosystems during the Mesozoic, specifically? Weather or climate? Climate? Um, weather. Well, in terms of weather conditions, since those are more of your day-to-day -day changes in the atmosphere, I don't know if, I guess I don't know enough about that level of variability. But in terms of climate, in terms of climate, uh, the fact that there were really warm, humid conditions was really uh, beneficial for lots of diverse plant life uh, to take place at that time. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the warmest times in, in geologic history, the Mesozoic. So there's some really interesting fossils because of that. Thank you. Okay, I think I'll field one of my uh, other questions here real quick. All right, I'll go with question number four on my list here. What has been your most enjoyable moment of fossil hunting throughout your career? Good question. You know, I wish they asked this on, on interviews, like for jobs. That would, that would be so nice. <laughs> uh, so when I was working at the Calvert Marine Museum... In 2001, it was my first official paleontology job. I was interning, uh, doing some work on fossil shark teeth, helping excavate uh, different pieces of marine mammal skeletons from the cliffs, and helped with some exhibits and uh, outreach events. There was one afternoon where the landowners who were letting us uh, excavate part of a dolphin skull on their property made us lemonade, uh, had fresh blueberries from the bushes <laughs> on the backyard. So it was wonderful. We just, you know, my colleagues and I were first preparing the specimen in the cliffs for excavation. And then, you know, we just went and relaxed and drank lemonade and had fresh blueberries. So that's kind of one of my most memorable uh, times in the field. That sounds like, it was, sounds like you had an amazing time doing that. <laughs> Did you find any um, megalodon teeth or anything of that nature? Yes, I have a collection of megalodon teeth. Actually, I, I have some that my dad gave me that he collected. So when we when we were in fossil clubs growing up, uh, you know, to go in the mine in Aurora, you have to be over eighteen. So I couldn't go. Uh, so my dad collected some specimens. So he gave those to me, and then I found some. Uh, in a few different places in the in the coastal plain as well. I think the the biggest one I have again is probably like the size of my fist. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, they're they're uh, they're sentimental as well, since you know family. Are you familiar with um, Donald Morgan? I don't believe so. He runs like a small paleontology museum. And um, his staff gave me a five-inch megalodon tooth. It was really cool. Ooh. Nice. Yeah, I've got a small little collection of megalodon teeth ranging from actual real ones of varying sizes, including one that fits right in the palm of my hand, a replica of a six- or seven-inch tooth. I have a, a fun fact about shark teeth. So for that job I just mentioned at uh, the Calvert Marine Museum. Or, well, well, it's a fun fact about me, so I don't know. Maybe it's not so fun as, <laughs> like, sharks shedding teeth every seven to ten days. But, uh, so, I looked at, I think, 24,000 shark teeth or something like that. 20, 21,000, over 20,000 for sure. Over 20,000. I can't quite remember the exact amount. As, as part of that study, that, that first summer when working in the, the basement of the museum. Oh no, here, here's the paper. I just opened it up on my computer. 24,409 shark teeth. <laughs> oh, wow. They, they kept me busy that summer. 
Now, my little question that relates to that, were all these shark teeth from all, they're all from varying species and families of sharks? Yeah, so they were all from the Miocene of Maryland. They were collections uh, that either were in the museum that had been removed from the cliffs or had been found as float on beaches um, and donated. Uh, so we were doing a study to look at, you know, did the shark teeth that erode out on the beaches that people collect, did that match what was in the museum collections that had been taken from the cliffs? So the different types of sharks, there were megalodon, uh, you know, bull sharks, requiem sharks, sand tigers, uh, makos. So a whole range of things for the Calvert, Chop Tank, and St. Mary's formations. It doesn't sound too different from the diversity of sharks that currently occupy that area today. Yes. So one of the things we talk about just a little bit in the paper is that the dominance of uh, carcariniform sharks today is very similar um, at that time versus earlier in, in history when the lamniforms, so your makos um, and uh, other sharks would would have been dominant then, but so we, we we just hint a little about the evolution of of sharks. That's so uh, very interesting, and I think I'll let Scott go into some more in depth discussion here about the Calvert formation and the other types of animals that have been found there, like you know crocodiles and seals and uh, so forth. So you want to take us away on a tour of the Calvert formation, Scott? Yeah, you know the. the the one unusual thing that I notice about the Calvert Formation is the co-occurrence of crocodilians and pinnipeds, which I think is highly unusual. And another thing I noticed, the uh, squalodon whale <clears throat> seems to have a set of teeth and a snout very similar to the Thika champs of crocodile that was living in the same area. Do you think they were probably competing for the same food in the, the same sort of ecological niche? The crocodiles and who? The squalodon whale. Squalodon calvertensis. Uh, I would suspect, given where they live, they might not be competing for exactly the same types of food, just in terms of accessibility to prey. Uh, but I don't really know enough about vertebrate food webs to say more, so I, I better not get myself into trouble. <laughs> I, know, I know I was, have you done any work at the, the Pollock Farm site in Delaware? No. Okay, well that's part of the Calvert Formation, and that's where a lot of these marine mammals have been found. Yeah, I know, I know, uh, those organisms are well represented in the formations, and, you know, there's also um, serenians, so sea cows. Yeah, you know, the Yeah. Yeah, so there's other uh, kind of large animals like that in there as well. Yeah. But they they just kept me busy with the shark teeth, so I didn't right. I didn't venture yeah, too yeah. much beyond that. <laughs> well, I didn't know. I just thought I would ask in case you had. Yes, yeah, Doctor Bobby Bossenecker is one of the guys who works yep. with some of the marine. I know, males. I know him. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Uh, so, sorry, whose question is next? I think I'll let you have another go at this, Sam. All right. Um, how did uh, diseases affect marine life during the Mesozoic or even the Devonian? Diseases? Yes. That is a really good question. And I, I just have to say that I don't really know. Um, I have seen some specimens that have shown evidence of disease, you know, say in, uh, for example, the, the Fossil Club for the Calvert Marine Museum, they, they regularly put out a newsletter, and, um, you know, sometimes they feature unique specimens like that, but I don't know enough about them to really say, say more than that. I'm sorry. It sounds really awesome, though. I kind of want to Google it right now and pretend that I know the answer, but I don't. I don't. <laughs> 
it's all right. Uh, from, from this point, from this point on, point on, I'm going to start asking more animal related questions. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, I I've read a lot of things about women in paleontology and about the women's movement in science, and I wanted to get your opinion on women in paleontology and how you, as a woman, have contributed to that into science and into paleontology. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a momentum in the last few years to, to feature women in paleontology and, and certainly women in science in general. And a few examples in paleontology, there's been some books out this year, like Daring to Dig, uh, and um, another one that I can't remember right now, as well as the Bearded Lady Project. I think you're, all... what you're talking about is She Found Fossils. Yes, thank you. She Found Fossils, yes. The, the sleep deprivation from having uh, two young children, three three years old and under, sometimes the, the memory is not always quite there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so there those are also some examples of kind of ongoing efforts to, to feature women in paleontology. The Association for Women Geoscientists has an award each year to feature a, a female paleontology student. And so I, I won that award uh, a few years ago. And I was also a uh, Ford Foundation Fellow to help promote diversity in academia. So I've been trying to do a lot of things uh, specifically, and of course, with a paleontological focus, given my expertise, that get um, a variety of, of audiences excited about paleontology as especially uh, young girls. Have you ever felt like paleontology wasn't for you? Have you ever felt, you know, because because you're a woman that you can't um, go into a field of science because of your gender? You know, it's been really interesting to have discussions about that in the last few years. So growing up, I never, you know, like as a kid, I never thought like, oh, I can't do paleontology because I'm a girl. Like that just didn't even cross my mind. Even though I didn't know any female paleontologists, you know, the the professionals I met at museums were all men. Um, but, but for some reason, uh, that never crossed my mind. However, as I continued to go into my schooling, uh, so undergraduate and graduate school, it wasn't so much that I couldn't do it because there are a lot of really awesome women in paleontology who are very supportive, but I became more aware of some of the challenges as I was experiencing training in the field and becoming a paleontologist myself. And so now kind of really being in the trenches, it's, it's apparent to see where, you know, being a woman, especially a mom, you know, it just, it, it, makes things a, a lot more challenging sometimes. Is there um, any advice that you would give to women or to young girls pursue science? So, more young girls should do science because science is awesome. <laughs> Bugs are cool. They're not icky. Uh, <laughs> I do a, a teacher education class and I, I try to convey that to my students. Mm -hmm. You know, go out, collect Insect, make an insect collection, you know, collect shells at the beach. Dig in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dig in the dirt. Don't be afraid to get dirty. Um, so, yeah, explore uh, that, you know, girls and, you know, anybody can can be a paleontologist. Uh, and, and really, again, kind of the same advice for if you want to have a career in paleontology is to, to go out, try to get those experiences and, and try to build your network and find supportive people. Because I definitely know since being in the professional community now for a while, having mentors, having female mentors uh, in particular at various places has been really amazing. And at times when maybe I didn't think I, I could handle the pressure of various things, having that support was, was really critical. So they can just contact me. We, we'll start there. They can contact me <laughs> or anybody, not just, you know, young girls. Um, yeah. yeah. Always happy to encourage people with fossil interests. Oh, of course. Absolutely. And I think that 
you know, there's been a lot of this movement in not just women in paleontology, but also diversification into paleontology with people with different ethnic background groups and upbringings all throughout life. Because yes. like you said, anybody can become a paleontologist. Yeah, and, and that is something I think our discipline really, really needs to work on. You know, the representation of women has been getting stronger and stronger, but we are still horribly underrepresented with respect to different um, minority groups, race, ethnicity, um, disabilities, you know, access to the fields. There's there's a lot more we could be doing. And interestingly enough, I am currently working on a manuscript that talks about teaching paleontology with more culturally competent approaches to try to improve equity uh, and using place-based learning to try to reach more audiences, um, thinking about ways that we can be more inclusive and try to promote diversity. And so I'm gonna present some of that material at the short course for the Paleontological Society uh, for the Geological Society of America meeting in uh, fall. So hopefully some people will listen so that oh, no. uh, you know we can do we can do a better job of not having the discipline be as uh, white as it as it is because we need a lot more diversity and, and differing perspectives in the field. I right. think having my so my brother is in a wheelchair um, and I think and, and he went fossil collecting with us like all growing up his family things and I think having uh, someone in my family who you know has a lot of different challenges uh, compared to myself has has made me more mindful of of that and so trying trying to help support whoever is interested and that people shouldn't feel excluded. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, that's that's very important because, as you know, I do a lot of paleontology outreach, and of course, I'm an African American, and I'm also on the autism spectrum, and that's something that I really like to push out there is not just to get male and women paleontologists, but people who may not have those same advantages that people grew up with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I and there's a lot of great, um, or increasingly, maybe I shouldn't say a lot, but increasingly there are more programs to support um, students with various identities that uh, could help improve representation uh, in geosciences, more broadly speaking, but hopefully paleontology as well. You're doing very great work, I must say. <sighs> well, thanks. I'm, I'm trying, but there's so much work to do. <laughs> Science is never done. <laughs> no, somebody told me once that, you know, no research is, is ever finished. You just either run out of time or funding. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are always more questions. There, there will never come a day where human beings know everything. There will always be something new to discover. Right, <laughs> and then right as soon as you find the answer to one question, it just brings about a whole bunch of new questions. So exactly. Science is, you know, our understanding is, is always evolving. That's amazing about science. I mean, just think, a hundred years ago, today science would be considered, you know, sorcery or, you know, dark magic, but nowadays we just know it's just a field of science or field of research. Nothing paranormal needed to explain X, Y, or Z. Just to right. make a reference. <laughs> or uh, even, like, you guys, you know, since y'all love dinosaurs, uh, not that I don't, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, I just... I was drawn to the invertebrates early on. What can I say? They they caught me early on. Uh, oh, yeah. But, you know, when I was learning about dinosaurs, none of them had feathers. And now we know so much more about that. You know, a thought of it recently occurred to me what uh, Greg kind of said about science maybe being considered a form of sorcery back in ancient times. You know, can, can you imagine what people back in those times would have thought if they had found the remains of dinosaurs? They probably would have thought they were the, the remains of dragons back in those times. Oh, well, they definitely did. Yeah, there, there are some really interesting uh, books and other sources uh, where kind of legends of fossils are talked about. And I, I mentioned a few of those in, in my paper um, that I'm working on right now. Yes, exactly. 
I, I see in the text box, sorry, that's what I'm saying, the yes exactly to, the uh, Native American legends of fossils. Yeah, I cite that work in my paper. I think one was on a protoceratops, so they thought it was probably some kind of griffin. Ah, I did not know that. It came to be that they found skeletons of protoceratops back in Mongolia, and that was the inspiration for the griffin myth. I see, yeah, I know a lot of the inspiration for some of the dragon um, myths comes in part from from dinosaur fossils. A, a lot, a lot, a lot of people believe that uh, stories of the cyclops were probably inspired by people finding the skulls of elephants or mammoths, probably. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And the, and regarding the cyclops, the reason ancient people, some ancient people might have thought that is because in elephants, there's an opening in the skull where the trunk would come out in life, but since the trunk is all 100% muscle, it never fossilizes. And cultures that are not familiar with elephants, if they had found the skulls of ancient elephants or uh, mammoths and saw that opening right there in the skull, they would assume it would have been a singular large eye. Whereas, you know, the elephant's eyes are actually on the side of the skull, and they're pretty small. I did not know that uh, connection. Very cool. Yeah, Scott was interested in knowing if you had ever come across any reworked fossils over the course of your research. Reworked fossils. Hmm. Uh, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I mean, a, a lot of my fossil collecting experience growing up was kind of, you know, items that had eroded out of cliffs into a creek bed or are on the beach. So, you know, they certainly were, were not in situ, but in terms of something that was found in a completely different unit and didn't belong there, um, I don't think anything like that. Uh, thank you for your, thank you for your uh, answer, Dr. Sachi. And I think I'll pick one of my questions out of the hat real quick. All right. The next one here. Question number five. Okay, number five. From the Calvert Formation, what has been the most interesting or unique fossil that you've uncovered from that site? Hmm. Uh... Maybe the most memorable, I, I don't know about interesting, maybe interesting to me since I don't really work on whales, but uh, I helped um, jacket and excavate part of a, a whale skull that we had found in the cliffs that summer I was working on um, the shark tooth project while I was there. So I think that experience for me, usually, usually dealing with the small little critters uh, was particularly cool. I gotta say, the little guys, they're, they are just as important as the big guys in terms of understanding <laughs> your ecosystems. That's right. <laughs> when I was looking through your bibliography, seems like I remember seeing you had done some work on Ordovician Silurian stuff, too. Yeah, so my very first paleontology research project uh, at Colgate University with Dr. Connie Soja was looking at some fossil um, Paleozoic reefs from Alaska and Russia. And so we were looking at a hydroid sponge potential relationship in the fossil record. Um, one, to better understand that relationship, uh, but also in terms of helping inform biogeography as to where the origin of the Alaskan terrain, or Alexander terrain, I'm sorry, accreted onto Alaska um, back at that time. So yeah, that was the very first thing I did, and uh, a lot of students were involved in, in that work. We also got to do some fun uh, taphonomy, so burial experiments in the lab, which, you know, made made it kind of stinky that we were burying things to see how well they decayed. <laughs> Sounds like kind of like the Burgess Shell, a little. Uh, well. I mean, in terms I think of trying, of yeah, in terms of trying to understand, um, you know, the potential for certain softer organisms to preserve, yeah, 
Yeah, I, could, like, I could see that connection. Seems like I recall reading that a lot of the fossils from the Burgess Shell were buried in cave-ins of mud, buried alive is one of the reasons that they were so well preserved. Right, very rapid burial is usually yeah. the only times you get that, that really great preservation. Yeah. Uh, I think I'll uh, ask my next question now. Um, do you think there are do you think there are many more varieties of trilobites other than what we've already found? I think it's possible. Um, I don't know about many more, um, but I think there are probably absolutely species that we have, have yet to uncover. I mean, it's amazing even in looking at modern fauna, right? There's, there's organisms, uh, like, I don't know if you saw in the news, there was a I think it was 1.5 million penguin colony off of the Danger Islands in Antarctica that nobody knew about. <laughs> and by using uh, satellite images and trying to track the location of where guano was, they they figured out where to look for these these penguins. So, you know, if there's live things that are missing like that, there's most certainly fossils that we have yet to uncover. Do you think there could have been uh, been trilobites that were considerably larger than the ones we've already found? Like, say, maybe example for example about the size of a dog. I think it could be possible. Yeah, because I I saw this horror movie once called Deep Freeze about this killer trilobite the size of a dog, <laughs> and, uh. I have, and I. It's, it's kind of made me wonder. I, I I wonder if that's possible, if a trilobite could really get that big. I mean, yeah, the large, I, the I think it depends on the size of a dog, <laughs> the size of the dog. <laughs> the largest trilobite we have on record is Isotelus rex, and that was found in Canada. But that's the biggest thing that we've gotten so far. They're giant isopods now. I think they get, like, maybe two feet long. Mm -hmm. Bathonomius. This is why arthropods would be my second love. <laughs> <laughs> after, after the mollusca, I'd go to the arthropods. Can, can I ask a question of you? I feel like that's a... Uh, or, or of y'all. <laughs> sure. Sure. I don't know if, if I'm going off script here as the guest. Uh, this, is, this is a debate I have sometimes with, with my colleagues. If you could visit, and I'm sure you've thought about this, any point in geologic time to go see some prehistoric life, what would you go see? If you could get in a time machine and go. Hands down, Cambrian. Even uh, though that the oxygen levels were quite low during that time, I would like to see the Cambrian, like like to see what Georgia was like underwater during you know the Cambrian, and probably look at some of the organisms. But yeah, I would definitely visit the Cambrian. I, 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 I would like to go to with the Cretaceous period to see what Tyrannosaurs and Triceratops were like. Mm -hmm. And you might think I'm going to say dinosaurs, but no, actually, I think I'd be more curious to see see what, you know, Pleistocene North America was like circa, you know, 15, Ooh. 20, 100,000 years ago. Yeah. See, to see the animals that once lived in North America but are now only, like, you know, like say, found in Africa. You know, the animals like mammoths, mastodons, lions, jaguars, and so forth. Oh, that's a good one. I would be the marine Jurassic of Southern England for me. Oh yeah. Oh, those are all. Oh, it, it just makes it hard. I feel like my go-to is the Ediacaran, right? These like first larger, multicellular, soft, squishy things that we don't really kind of know exactly what they were doing. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I'm I'm drawn to that, but it's so tough because there's so many other times like. The Pennsylvanian, you know, swamps. Like, I think that would be really awesome. It's just too, too many options, but yeah. Um, if, if I had to name a second time period, I would like to go with, right around the time that the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons existed to learn more about them. Yeah, it would be really interesting to see those interactions in place. 
Okay, and in the second and the further, Sam's new comment about wanting to see Nerathos and Cro-Magnons. You know, we have so much evidence now through DNA that the, uh, that our ancestors interbred with the Nerathos. That'd be interesting to see just how those uh, interactions eventually led to, you know, some people today mm -hmm. actually having Neanderthal DNA in their family tree. Yeah, the, the work that's been coming out about human evolution over the last few years has been fascinating. I have a question more, um, more to your topic. Um, how was it like being a professor at Georgia State University? How is, what is it like? Uh, well, in general, I, I love what I do. And, you know, I, my job is great because I get to do a variety of things. I can do research with students. I can teach classes of varying grade levels. I can, um, I go do outreach programs. So, so my position at Georgia State is a teaching track. Um, focused job and so there's a lot of teaching and service expectations and research is kind of just bonus I don't have to do it in my position but I can do it and it's certainly extremely valuable for students to get experience learning science by actually doing science so I try to integrate doing research as much as possible with my students and uh, you know working with the students is so much fun and now that I'm undergrad director I also do a lot of the kind of behind the scenes advising of students to help them figure out their courses and career path options so I'm I'm learning lots about an array of fields in geosciences to to really try to help the students have a how was the how was the classroom size is it large is it small so it Completely depends on the class. My paleontology class is usually somewhere between 15 and 20 people. Um, when I teach an introductory geology class, that can be 120 people. So it really ranges, but I try to, you know, not have it be just about listening to me standing in the front of the classroom, but getting students to do activities or I'm, I'm actually developing a lot of lesson plans right now using the city of Atlanta for you know as a kind of learning laboratory so there's tons of awesome building stones to talk about in geology class just on campus or close by or you know there's plenty of examples of weathering erosion around <laughs> so we we get to go outside and explore a bit too uh, even in, in those larger classes so I, I actually, I'm actually planning to uh, head over to Georgia State after I finish uh, my associates, and I wanted to take your paleontology class. Uh, oh, well, it's uh, it's going to be offered in fall. So I don't know if you're ready to come in fall, but that's when I'm going to do it. Oh, that's going to be great. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. And Ooh, I'm, I'm nervous. You're so knowledgeable. <laughs> Maybe I'm you should leave the class on vertebrates. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with both invertebrates and vertebrates, but when it comes to like mollusk and marine paleontology, I'm a little sketchy on that. Ah, uh, well, you you will either love or hate mollusks by the end of the class because there will be a <laughs> a lot of shells. <laughs> well, uh, I'm I'm not really an expert on mollusks on mollusks, but I am quite fascinated with cephalopods in particular. And in fact, that happens to be my next question: Is a cephalopod related? Awesome. Yeah, cephalopods are amazing. <clears throat> Let's see if it has to be the ammonites. Sorry, what? Oh, I didn't, do you have a, a specific question, Sam, or did I, I miss it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, sorry, I thought somebody else was speaking. Do you want me to ask my next que question now? Sure. Yeah, pardon me, I thought somebody else was speaking. My mistake. <laughs> uh... Apart apart from orthocones, could there have been could, could there have been other giant squid or other large cephalopods before the Mesozoic or even during the Mesozoic? Hmm. Well, I think it depends on your definition of large. Were there, you know, larger nautiloids? Yes. Were there things like the giant squids that we know of today? I don't know if they were they were quite that big at that time. 
Um, I think what we know hasn't found anything to that level, but you know, we're we're always making new fossil discoveries. Yeah, I well, th- th- this is just my opinion, of course, but I think that if a creature like the giant squid can exist, there's no reason to think that something like a giant octopus could not also exist. I, 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 I think that would be amazing if, if, if somebody found evidence that a giant octopus really does or at one time did exist. A, a sort of kraken type of a <laughs> creature? Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope that was a good question. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think there are probably more uh, discoveries to be made about cephalopods, but I, I don't know enough to, to say the likelihood of, of certain um, types. You know, there's there's a lot in the Mesozoic with uh, cephalopods for you know specimens getting really large. I've I've seen some massive ammonites in england Texas, um, and yeah and the midwest has has some here it was, you know, it was so hard to you know because we're like walking on the beach in england and obviously many other people had seen the same specimen and it's just too massive to be moved anywhere but oh it was it's like a small car <laughs> I, 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 I saw this uh, documentary once called The Future is Wild, and in one of the final episodes, it, it was speculated that if something were to happen to humans, like humans were to all go extinct and maybe even leave the planet altogether, cephalopods could potentially replace us as the most intelligent creatures on this planet if the conditions were right. They certainly are uh, amazingly intelligent creatures. Um, and I, I think we're, we're learning some more about some other organisms too, in terms of, uh, their ability to understand and communicate and do things more, more than we anticipated. But yeah, I mean, you know, anytime you see an octopus in an aquarium and and what it can do and how many times they have escaped from (laughs) different aquaria. Videos on that of them actually climbing out of their tanks and across the floor to get back to the open ocean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my um, one of my friends actually got a job at an aquarium because of how well she handled a octopus that was trying to escape and uh, sucking and crawling up her arms. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually fed an oct- I actually fed the octopus once at, at uh, our local zoo on a school field trip. Well, it reached one of its tentacles out and grabbed a hold of my finger, and I gotta tell you, that thing was strong. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're seriously strong. Yeah, but, I mean, you you wouldn't think at first glance, you probably wouldn't think that an animal like that would be that strong because they're all kind of squishy and slimy. <laughs> They're surprisingly a lot more muscular than they look. <laughs> That's right. You you can't underestimate the mollusk. You know, you you saw what happened to Johnny Depp and the Kraken. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question. Um, I have a question. Uh, what is your work? Uh, what is your work with uh biostratigraphy and um geography in general? So, uh, I have done biostratigraphic work as part of courses um, and also in terms of some of the research invo- I'm involved in with colleagues for the, the plio-pleistocene, more in the sense that as we are identifying different molluscan faunas in outcrops around the southeastern U.S. trying to, you know, understand exactly where um stratigraphically these these units are um, that sometimes has also involved um, using strontium isotopes to try to get a handle of, on uh, the ages but kind of the traditional biostratigraphy that you learn in a class I haven't used kind of those types of approaches in in the field myself do you know any specific measurements that you would use in order to measure rock layers? 
Specific measurements, you mean like using a Jacob staff or? Like kind of like a Jacob staff or are there any tools that you would usually use to measure? Um, well, that's kind of the, the go-to for measuring sections. Um, you know, you can also bring transect tape to measure the extent mm -hmm. of a, a layer at an outcrop. Um, now, now there's apps where you can take strike and dip, and <laughs> you don't even oh, you, you, don't know, have a compass? You, you don't even need a compass because it's part of an app. Yeah. Well, I think I need to use that when I'm taking geology because wow, I didn't, I had no idea that existed. Yeah, there are. I, you know, I'm I'm slowly trying to become familiar with some of the technological tools um, in apps that can be used and. There's, they just they just keep growing. So, I I hope to use some more of them in my teaching as I, I become more familiar with them. I'm working on designing an activity right now that'll use macrostrat and rocked um, for some geology field work where people can just have it on their iPhone and be out in the field and identify layers or take photos and make observations about what they see. So I think that those things will be really fun for kind of expanding the geoscience community in a more publicly accessible way. And with the fossils, can you correlate them? Do you know any specific index fossils that you would use? Oh yeah, for certain research projects, we have different um, fossils that mark what uh, deposits you're in. So it, it just depends on the project. Usually it's not so much one fossil, but kind of a suite of, of different species in a unit. Any formations that you can name off the top of your head that you've worked with? Uh, like the Waccamaw Formation and the Duplin Formation for that uh, Pliocene place to seam boundary. So the Duplin has a lot more diversity and some more uh, warm water taxa. Uh, so there's some different snails that we would see in that formation that, that we don't see in the Waccamaw, and that's part of the uh, extinction episodes that my, my colleagues and I are, are looking at. Well, that's, that's something, yeah, that's really neat research, because I'm interested in biostratigraphy and things of that nature and how to measure and using the specific fossils to date some of the rock layers, and I, I find that really interesting to learn about. Well... More, more will come if you are joining me for paleontology in the fall. <laughs> uh, I have, I got uh, two more questions here. I'd like to finish up if that's all right. All right, I will try to answer them quickly before I have to rush to daycare to pick up the kiddos. All right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Uh, what were some of the earliest known relatives or ancestors of lobsters? Ooh. Earliest known relatives. You know, I'm not sure off the top of my head. However, I have seen, so we have a, a lobster expert here at Georgia State, um, Chuck Derby. And occasionally he and I have shared some papers about some work on early crustaceans or early arthropods in general uh, from, you know, the Cambrian. But I... I don't know any specific taxa off the top of my head. No problem. Uh, the final question here is, uh, how large do you think Eurypterids could have been? Oh, Eurypterids. Oh, man, if there was one fossil I wanted in my collection that I do not have, it's Eurypterid. <laughs> oh. uh, how large? Um, well, I mean, I have seen Eurypterids several feet long, um, but exactly how large I'm I'm not sure. Scorpia is is one of the largest ones that I know of. Uh, all right. Uh, well that uh, finishes out my questions. Awesome. Yes. And I see, I see you to a, uh, a, is this the last question or? 
This may be the last question because I know you have to pick up your children. So. I know they they actually charge you like two dollars a minute or something if you're late. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, time is time is money. So Gregory, having, this maybe have to be the last question if there <laughs> any more. I'm having fun. Um, I mean, you know, I might be able to answer things quickly, but yeah, I I do have to go in the next five minutes or so. Yeah. All right, so the question. Greg, do you want to ask it or should uh, I just? Uh, uh, I've got, got it in the chat, chat here. It is why has been your fondest memories of working in collections at the Paleontological Research Institution in Calvert Marine Museum and doing education outreach via Marine Quest and your work as an instructor for high school earth science and field research in the Bahamas, Belize, Brazil, and Argentina, as well as your participation in the National Park Service and across the United States? Whew, that, was, that was a lot of. Uh, a lot of examples of things I have done. <laughs> so I already shared a fond memory from the Calvert Marine Museum with the lemonade and blueberries while excavating a dolphin skull. Uh, the Paleontological Research Institution, a fond memory was when, this is kind of a silly memory, but I was helping to package um, mastodon bones and I had never seen the packaging tape dispensers you know that with like the wheels and you have the handle and so you could just kind of go crazy like wrapping the tape around the bubble wrap around the bones and I I was like wow this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen and the director Warren Allman was like really one of the coolest things you've ever seen and I was like okay you got me <laughs> probably these fossils are are even more cool I'm just really excited about packaging them with this cool tape dispenser. Uh, so <laughs> that's kind of a, a fond memory. Uh, let's see. And other places. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've done field work in the Bahamas, Belize, Brazil, and Argentina. Uh, maybe in Argentina, I'll, I'll end with this memory because it's uh, paleontologically appropriate. So uh, I was in Patagonia collecting modern uh, shells, uh, but for a, a paleontological study, and I was in a place that Darwin had visited on Darwin's birthday, and so mm -hmm. I just thought that was that was really amazing, and I, I can't remember if I teared up then. I, I know I did when I saw a copy of the Origin of Species in the museum in in London. Um, it just really. It was an, an emotional moment. So that was a, a fond memory. And I think that's a perfect way to bookend this episode of the podcast today, Dr. Masaji. Well, thank you so much. It was great. You guys have really, uh, as always, now I have more questions and research to do. <laughs> <laughs> it was great seeing you again. Yeah, nice to, to see you on Skype. And, and hopefully in person sometime soon. Well, if it wasn't for Cam recommending you, we wouldn't be having this interview today, Dr. Versace. Yes, Cam, thanks so much for the recommendation. Welcome. I, I, I appreciate it. And thank you all for your great questions and for inviting me today. You're, you're welcome, Dr. Versace. It was an honor to have somebody new on the show and have a chance to talk about something other than dinosaurs for a change. <sighs> I know. I forced you to do it, but you know it was good for you. No, <laughs> it no. wasn't too painful. No, no, it wasn't. I was like learning about other types of animals. I usually don't pay much uh, thoughts to. <laughs> I, awesome. I, 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 I tried to come up with the best questions I can think of, but you know what? Uh, the, the, uh, of arthropods and mollusks are not really my area of expertise. I'm more of a dinosaur expert. <laughs> Yeah, well, every everyone has their, their specialty, and, you know, we all need to study different things to get our understanding of, of the fossil record, and then kind of how we, how we can approach modern conservation problems by, by better okay. understanding what's, what's happened before in Earth history. So much out there. Yeah, so keep, keep asking questions. Is that Thank, you. Is, Thank you. Thank you. And if I have one final thing to say here, there is no such thing as a bad question in science. Absolutely nope. not. 
Nope, yeah, when my students are like, well, this might be a bad question, I'm like, no such thing. <laughs> In my opinion, it's only a stupid question if you already know the answer to it. <laughs> and you know. <laughs> There's always more to learn. Awesome. Well, I have to run, unfortunately, so I'm sorry to uh, cut the, the fossil phone short, but um, thank you again, and I look forward to uh, crossing paths in the future, I guess. You are always, the door is always welcome for you to come back on, Dr. Saji, if, if you have any new research you'd like to share with us. Yeah, I'm always welcome to come back and talk about it. Yeah, you guys are always welcome to come back on, Dr. Saji, if Thanks so much, y'all. Yep, you're welcome. welcome. And it's one be more thing I like to ask. Where can people follow you exactly? Ah, uh, follow me. Social. I know. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. Um, ah, follow me. I guess I guess that's something I need to work on, huh? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I, have a, I have a web page at work, and I, you know, am involved in different organizations. Um, but... I think between work and the two little kiddos, I haven't uh, gone crazy with social media promotion yet. So, so maybe that's something I can expand on in the future. So as for us, you can follow us on the YouTube sh the YouTube channel. I'll be uploading to Xterm Central. You can follow us on Facebook in the group History a Traveler's Guide, and we also frequently do collaborations with the Prehistoric Times with editor Mike Fredericks. So, and all, I think I'll conclude here with saying once again, this has been Prehistory Charles Guide. I am your host, Greg. Have a good night, everybody. And as my good friend Andres Perez, a good guy to always say, take care, everyone. <laughs>